think of them on that side, and then there's individual ones uh, near where you came. From. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Subject to banking hall. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. anyways, um, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, but we have three great talks today, and um, you know, since we're already running a little bit behind, uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in, right, uh, with Jessica's favorite dash tricks. Let's give it up to Jessica. Hey, um, this is my second grade info meetup, and this is why I've only been cutting for three years. So. Um, but somehow I got ripped into this. But anyway, I'm excited to talk to you. So this is um this presentation is very much inspired by what I do for my actual job. Um, I do a lot of things uh laboratory related. I do a lot of like software development and uh. What do you do? What do you do at Garden Health? Everything. Yeah. What does Garden Health do? Uh, Garden Health makes. Oh my God! Really? <laughs> okay. Garden Health is a precision oncology company that makes state of the art liquid biopsy tests for cancer detection. Thank you. Did I do good? Did I get my yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but I'm actually more considered about the laboratory aspects. Um, I come from the laboratory sciences and I've moved on to coding the whole time. And um, so a lot of what I'm concerned about is laboratory performance, reagent performance, quality control, uh, data analysis, troubleshooting, and a little bit of software development too. So um, like I said, this, this talk is very much inspired by my actual job. So if you're wondering how, like, if I use these basic, basic tools in real life, yes, yes, I do. So let's talk more about them. So um, we're talking about dash dashboards today. And um, what a, I just want to, just in case nobody's aware of the concept of a dashboard, dashboards really, for me, are like the ultimate data visualization tool. It's a lot of stuff in one place that is very user-friendly, and it has a lot of really good design principles that are built into it got to be user friendly obviously if you're writing code for someone else and for a front end for someone else they better be able to use it it's got to be fast because users don't like waiting for stuff it's got to have the appropriate graph types so you get the insight that you're looking for from your data very quickly um the use of color is judicious and appropriate uh, it's also got to be intuitive you don't want to have to have an extensive training scenario for your users to be able to use your tool and it's also well organized you don't want to put the right button all over the place whatever so, and just for me, um, to get on my soapbox just a little bit, this is a coding meetup and I promise we're going to get to coding, but really the best dashboards run themselves. You should set up the thing and then you should let it go and it should exist. And really the ultimate goal of the dashboard is so people have to stop bothering you for data analysis requests. So you can move on with your brain and your coding skills to something else. So that conversation often involves things like who is your user and what is the problem they are trying to solve? What's UAT? Uh, sorry, user acceptance testing. Okay. So um, I was going <clears> to, <throat> yeah. So please talk to your users, do your due diligence. Don't ask them what they want because they often don't know what they want. Ask them what problems they're trying to solve, what insights they're trying to gain and what they want to move on from this data and what they want to put in their PowerPoint presentation when they present their process, right? So coding with your user in mind, really it saves everyone's time. Like maybe that annoying feature that you didn't think should be a thing but was requested by a user, just, just do it. So they're going to be happier. They're going to leave you alone. And again, if you're on PCO, but other people can still mine data, then you don't have any people slacking you a million times like, hey, where's this thing? It's presentations tomorrow. Like, you know, getting inspired by real life events, right? So just soapbox moment for me is do your due diligence. Talk to your users. Know who your target audience. Just like giving a talk, software like this and dashboards are for people. And people use things the way they want to use things. So just have that conversation. Talking to people is scary, I know. But it saves you a lot of time down the road, I promise. So I promise we're going to talk about Toad. So dashboards are very, very easy with Plotly and Dash. So I was kind of, these packages were kind of chosen for me. Um, other dashboards at the company were written with Plotly and Dash. And I was kind of thrown the Git repo and go, here we go, build a dashboard. And I'm like, yeah, cool, let me just do that. But it uh, turns out Plotly and Dash are very easy to use and have been um, very well documented. The community is fantastic. I've been really pleased with my experience with Plotly and Dash. So my favorite dash tricks are inspired a little bit by the documentation things I want you to know about, but also things that I've had to dig really hard for that I wish I knew before I had to dig really hard for them. So we're going to talk about four specific things. We're going to talk about Jupyter Dash, um, the idea of showing and hiding elements from the user, um, the idea of a multi-page app, and graph rendering when you have a multi-site menu. So with further ado, let's get to the code. So I'm totally going to ask you to trust me today because Jupyter Dash does run very much inside of Jupyter. But this is a loaner laptop and I couldn't figure out how to get it to work. So we're going to run it in external mode, but that's going to be okay. So Jupyter Dash runs like um, runs right inside Jupyter. So all I'm doing, this is the like the most basic structure of a Dash app that you can put up on itself. 
Um, I'm loading some data about tips. And then here's where I create the instance of the app. And I use Jupyter Dash. If we were doing just a regular Dash app, it would be just Dash. And then I would be doing this from a script in the command line. And then we configure the app layout through divs. So the cool thing about Dash is it's basically Python wrappers for writing HTML code. So I'm writing HTML code without having to actually write HTML code. So divs are kind of like little bricks of organization. And we pass the big parent div here as um, the biggest div. And then we can pass several other divs within it. So I have an H1 heading here. And H1 only refers to the size. So that's the title of the thing. We are passing in a graph. And the graph has an ID. That's going to be important later. And then we have a label where we can actually choose the color scale drop down. So we're calling the element drop down here, and it can be configured with a variety of properties. Also, one of the main features of the dash dashboard is the interactive and the, the interactive aspect of it. And the interactive aspect is done through callbacks. So this is a callback, and this uses a decorator. And you have the output location you want to output to the ID graph. So this is why your elements need to be named. The property figure, because I want to put the graph, the figure in the figure part of the graph. And where this is going to come from is my drop down called the color scale drop down, and the value that I'm actually picking is the value. And this function will simply update the figure here using the color scale that I've actually picked. So when I run this, oh, come on, don't be like that. Oh my God, my way you were right about failing a live demo. Demo gods. Demo gods, come on. I tested this <laughs> really earlier. Don't make me, oh my God, fine. It's probably running, so you can just access it. You know, and then the other stupid thing is I haven't figured out how to reset the app without restarting the whole kernel. So mm -hmm. if anybody knows how to do that. My God, I'm sorry. I'll give you a different port. Okay. So, okay. So, um, oops, I should have copied that link. Localhost one. Thank you. <laughs> I was prepared for this. Okay. So we have our Jupiter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not too much debugging here, right, guys? So this one, the drop down element gives you a host of different colors. So you do rainbow if you really feel like it. And um, so this is the base of interactivity. Now, this is kind of like a dumb 101 kind of how does it work thing. Like in reality, you choose the color for your users. You don't let your users choose the color. Okay. <laughs> Design principles by Jessica. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the next, um, so that's Jupyter Dash. So Jupyter Dash, if you were to run this inline, um, you would just call run server and then mode equals inline. And again, I don't know why this doesn't work inside of VS Code on my this laptop, but it doesn't. But if you were, but it would also um, populate the dashboard like right below the cell. So you can, if, if again, if it works, you can make live edits and uh, interactive edits to your dashboard as we're working on it. Okay, but uh, I didn't do that, so that's not what we're doing today. Um, I also just want to draw your attention to the imports a little bit. We have the Jupyter Dash. Um, from Dash, we import a couple different things. This is the Dash core components, which are the interactive elements. Um, HTML, again, the wrappers that let you write HTML code. And these are the three main ways you interact with callbacks, which are input, output, and state. I'll get to that in a second. So sometimes users um, are not allowed to pick things, or sometimes things simply aren't an option. So you want to be able to show and hide elements judiciously in your dashboard. So for this particular example, we're expanding on the tip data. And if you notice, so this is the thing that I had to dig really hard for. You can also modify the style properties of the element that you're working on in addition to the content. So if you notice, I've added these elements here because these elements, like a dropdown, they have a property called style. So in style, you can pass things like width. Like I hate that giant you know, menu that spans the entire length of the window. So I just cut it in half. Also, it has a property called display. And display block means on. But also, you'll notice I have display none, which means off. So in practice, what this looks like, oops. I know, I know, no, thank you. This is how I talk to my computer when I'm out of it. So, so I also personally like to start with an autograph right in front of your face and let the user choose. So this is the tip data, and we're looking at tips from each different day. So if I look at the tips on Sunday, you'll notice the element disappeared. That's because Sunday only has dinner service. Okay, so choosing between lunch and dinner shouldn't even be an option for the user. And that's going, and that's going to leave them with like a little bit less FOMO. So we're like, oh, Sunday doesn't have any lunch data. I'm like, well, yeah, Sunday doesn't have any lunch data because we don't even serve lunch on Sundays. But if you notice, if I pick Friday here, this menu returns. Well, I can look to serve lunch or dinner on Saturday. And then the user knows, oh, this is a double day service. I can actually look at lunch and dinner separately. So sometimes you want to not even give the user an option or give the user another option depending on the context of your data. And this really just comes from me 
studying the data frame and realizing, oh, Friday is the only one that actually has two options. So again, I want to highlight. Yeah, go ahead. So why wouldn't you have that be an option, but have it grayed out so that people know that you didn't like forget to code it in, but it's grayed out. You That's also an option. That's also totally an option. Um, there are, is a parameter called disabled, and you could set that to true or false, and it'll just lock the elements in the gray state. I prefer to just not even show it. So, because I don't want them to click anything they shouldn't be clicking or like, just go, why is this button broken? You know, kind of thing. Again, real experiences that I've had. It. Just go, why can I click on this? Like, because you're not supposed to. If you're not supposed to, I just don't even want them to look at it. Okay. So that is, so that's just one example. You can show hide any element using the style property. Every single element in Dash has a style property that you can modify. So that took me a lot of digging. <laughs> I was like, I just want to take a menu away. Like, so that happens. Okay. And moving right along. Um, I want to introduce the idea of a multi-select menu. So this is um, a very user-friendly uh, option where it lets you pick only the stuff you want to show. And um, the implementation of this is a little bit less clear, like the practical implementation of this is a little bit less clear than it's in the docs. So you're going to notice I'm pulling a new import here. This is called dash bootstrap components. This is another like buttons, graphs, you know, time pickers like general interactive elements this is another library of interactive elements. And when I'm using the data, so I actually have written a cute little function here that will subset my data frame based on the lots that I've chosen and then return a graph only based on those lots. So I still have the very same structure of the app. I'm still, um, I'm using a different data set that I kind of made it myself to kind of mock what I see in a QC environment. Uh, so we have <laughs> this uh, several lots so we have an efficiency metric that the user wants to graph. So, and here my callback here is feeding back to the graph, to the figure property, and it's taking in, notice it's taking in two things here. I've created this new thing called a button, and the button says render graph on it, and the button click is actually what's going to trigger the rendering of the graph. So this is where the difference between input and output and state becomes, um, becomes necessary. State means feed it in right as it is. It doesn't matter. Whatever it says right now is the element. But input relies on the user changing something or the user clicking something. So because I want them to pick all of their lots, decide they're done, then click a graph render button, I feed in the state of the dropdown and then the input of the value or the input of the button that actually is going to render the graph. So when I do end clicks, so um, the button has a property called end clicks. When I click, I want it to do something and that's what this callback is going to do. So in practice, what this looks like is a menu up here. So I have six lots that I can choose from, and maybe I only want to view the odd ones. But see, if I was picking and if I had called input in here instead of state, this graph would have changed every single time I clicked something. That's super annoying, and we're not done yet. Okay, so instead, I decoupled the interaction of choosing the lots from the rendering of the graph using a button. So when I choose these lots, okay, now I'm done. I can click render graph, and then the graph is rendered. So this value, like the points are really tiny, but you get the point. Okay, so sometimes decoupling of the actual data from the graph and using an element to render the graph is going to help make your user experience more friendly, specifically within the context of multi-select multi -select menus. Okay, and then finally, the holy grail of all of these things is the multi-page app. So um, Dash apps are called apps, you know, they're that's their nomenclature, but you can also make multi-page ones. And that means having a much more complex, much more rich dashboard where you can choose what the user is going to see at any given time. So um, for my final trick, you will notice that the structure of the app has very much changed. This does not look like anything that I've shown you before. Basically, again, I'm creating an instance of the app. I'm passing in layout. What I'm putting here is a DCC link, and it says page name, and it's going to have the reference, which is the link that actually shows in the bar for page and desk page registry values, and you're gonna pass in the page container. So what does that actually mean? Well, I'm gonna show you the practice before I, oops, no. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh my God. So I'm gonna show you what this does before I show you the code behind it. Oh my God, again, seriously. 1112. Yep, thank you. There we go. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like before I show you the code. So we have a home page and a tip page. Oh, oh, we're not even gonna run today. Oh, come on. Oh, sad. This worked like 10 minutes ago. All right, right of passage, guys. I did fail. I failed a live demo. Okay, let's try one more time. 
Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is a home page where it says Python. But if I, so I can put whatever I want on here. But if I want my user, okay, user, you are interested sometimes in tips. I'm gonna click on oh, tip page. And now we have returned back to the graph that I started all of this with. So the addition of a multi-page, you can curate what your user sees at any given moment, and then you can further divide the data that they see into small digestible subsections. And that is how you enrich the experience. Also, this code got way easier before I first started it. If you're running Dash 2.5 and above, this is automatically rolled into the package. They released this in the lab context, and that's how I figured it out. Um, but, um, but now it's fully rolled into Dash. So if you're using Dash, you get to see the experience, the full experience. And now I'm going to show you the code. I have this directory here called pages, and pages have simple pie scripts. So in this, it looks much more like the app that you're used to. So here's what I'm calling my imports. But now we've added this cute little thing called dash register page. And this, and then the path, you can specify the link path if you want to. So this is the home page, I just put a backslash. And then you pass, instead of calling app.layout, you just create a variable called layout, and that's going to get passed into the layout container. And that is what's actually below the page. So this is the home page. I put an H1 heading and I put, this is another way to get a brand icon on there. You have a, a directory called assets and you pass in fabicon.ico and it'll put whatever image you want. It's great. This is where I put the garment logo when I'm making dashboards for me. And then the tip page, again, same thing. Here's where I load my data. I actually don't need that. Um, but you pass out the, pass the divs into the layout container and even my callbacks are right here. So the multi-page app got so much easier. Again, you only have to register the page. And now the plugin will actually auto-sense the names of your uh, the names of your pages and let you everything for you. And then again, inside, inside the app itself, all I have to do is create uh, the dash page registry values, which is a dictionary. Yeah, which is a dictionary. And then the name of the page that's passed in right into DCP. So it'll automatically populate all this for you. Mm -hmm. So again, so the quality of this just exploded. So if you're making Dash apps, you should make multi pages. Okay, and that's all I have for you today. Um, I guess, so thanks for listening, and thanks to all my amazing teach coworkers that helped me do code. And um, the community, of course, actually, um, Adam of Farming Data commented on my YouTube comment when I was trying to figure out how to add a go home button to my page. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. And of course, you, thanks for listening. Great job, thank you very much. Thank um, you. Your multi-page apps.